I had a retirement luncheon on the day I retired from the courtroom in Hilo, and the clerk who was kind of in charge of introduced me that afternoon as uh, the judge who said, I hear you. And so I left, I left the, uh, the Big Island court job with the, uh, taking with me the, uh, the understanding that if the, if the staff had heard me that clearly, that the people who were in court had heard me as well. And so that was the best I could do. William Yama Chillingworth racked up a lot of mileage in his 25-year career as a state judge on Hawaii Island. He traveled widely throughout the Big Island to hear cases, and he retired content that he gave voice to every defendant who came through his courtroom. William Yama Chillingworth, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. He was known in courtrooms throughout Hawaii Island as Judge William Chillingworth. But to family and friends, he is Yama. While that may sound like a Japanese nickname, it's based on the Hawaiianized version of William, Williyama, Yama. He's very proud of his native Hawaiian heritage. Chillingworth's family line includes Princess Victoria Ka'iulani, who was next in line to the throne when the Hawaiian monarchy was overthrown in 1893. Ka'iulani was sister to Chillingworth's great-grandmother. It was while researching part of his native Hawaiian ancestry that Chillingworth discovered he comes from a family of native Hawaiian bird collectors on Hawaii Island, and that's where he spent most of his youth and most of his career. I was born in Honolulu in uh, 1943. My uh, dad was in the army in uh, New Guinea when I was born, and he was with uh, General MacArthur. And uh, my mother was from Hilo, and uh, having no family in Honolulu after I was born, uh, she and I returned to Hilo. and. Uh, stayed with my uh, maternal grandparents. And then uh, after the war, my um, father came back and we lived in Hilo and uh, I grew up there. My grandfather was the um, proprietor of the Hilo Drug Company and it was uh, this wonderful 50s fountain and drug store at, on what they described as the busiest corner in Hilo, and it was. Back when uh, pharmacies had fountains. Absolutely. So there were the, the, it was a 50s the, the fountain. stools and the, the stools, milkshakes. The, the, uh, the uh, straw containers that you lift it up and pull, it had everything. And um, my grandfather was a pharmacist. He, he, he came to the island of Hawaii after he graduated from the University of California. Berkeley and settled in Hilo, met my grandmother, who was uh, half German, half Hawaiian. My grandfather was Harry Arthur Wessel. How many pharmacists were there? There was one, that was my grandfather. He was it. And um, so it was uh, growing up in Hilo at the, uh, the Wessels drugstore and having my grandmother, who was a public school teacher, and my mother who followed in her footsteps as a public school teacher. It was a mixed blessing. They were both rather strict about using proper English. You were not able to mess around with pigeon. In Hilo, you couldn't Hilo, speak pigeon? Absolutely How not. did that go over with completely, the boys and the girls? Completely forbidden. <laughs> um, it was easy, but when we were in school, especially junior high, it wasn't so easy because most of the kids we were in with were not speaking English. They were, they were speaking whatever it was they were speaking. And um, my brother was, was better at socializing that way than I was. I was, I was kind of stuck. And, and uh, until I got to Punahou, I was having a very hard time in school because I had to hide that I was interested in doing well. 
and uh, you went to uh, schools in Hilo, right? Public middle public and did you go public schools? I, you went to elementary school uh, and then intermediate school as well in Hilo, right? And, and did uh, you really not speak pidgin during that time? Well, when my mother and my grandmother were around, I wasn't speaking pidgin, but quite frankly, in class, in a in a classroom where you were. <clears throat> Having to deal socially with kids who were not on your scholastic level, it was difficult. It was difficult. There was liable to be recrimination and um, anger and because uh, you were showing them up with grades. Exactly, I was doing better than they were, and so I had to hide that. And uh, how'd you hide it? Uh, just pretend that I didn't care about what I was doing, and um, you know, not answer questions in class, et cetera, et cetera. So what was it about um, the Hilo? Was it was the um, social norm to pretend you didn't care? Or, yeah. did you, or did you feel people was, really didn't care? It was tough. It was tough. There was a lot of, my friend Stanley Rorick refers to the Alma crab syndrome, where the crab that is climbing out of the bucket gets pulled down by the crabs that are underneath. Stanley is that way. and and and. and he um, talks about that. There's an element of that in, in what was going on. So, mm -hmm. so what, what what do you think would have happened if you stayed in the public school system in the area? Good question. Good question. I'm not sure. I'm glad I didn't have to make that um, decision myself. I'm I'm awfully glad I ended up where I did. Where William Yama Chillingworth ended up was Honolulu in a top private school, Punahou. His family moved to the city at the start of his 10th grade year. For the first time, he says, he felt at home in the classroom. Getting into Punahou was like going to heaven. I mean, because I was in a classroom environment with equals and everybody was in there. People who wanted to do well in school. The same thing that I wanted to do and uh, it was heavenly. I mean, I had the best time. So you had to make a social transition to Punahou. Uh, and was it hard in class? <laughs> Only in math and science. <laughs> I was terrible in math <laughs> and science. I sucked. Um, and and um, I was fabulous the rest of the rest of the way out. So that, you know, that made it fairly easy. I wasn't going into science. I wasn't going into any field that required mathematics. William Yama Chillingworth received that political science degree from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Next, he earned a law degree at the University of Denver Law School. And of course, it was, I'm sure it was expected that you would go to college. Had your parents been to college? Your mom's a teacher. My mom, uh, my mom was accepted at Stanford, and then they couldn't send her because they didn't have the money at the time. And uh, she went to University of Hawaii at Manoa. And um, my dad had been headed in that direction, and then he got into the National Guard after uh, he graduated from high school. His father was the, my grandfather was the CEO of the Territorial National Guard in the 30s. He was the head man. And my father was kind of, my father was the, the best soldier in the Punahou RTC program his sophomore year. So my father was being groomed for the Army and uh, got into the Territorial National Guard with my grandfather and was actually in charge of a detachment that was tasked with going down to Koalaus and uh, refurbishing the pillboxes that were on the top of the ridges um, just before the war started. And um, so then he was in the war. And um, New Guinea, that was rough fighting, wasn't oh, it? Oh, it was one of the worst theaters in the war. They, they talk about that theater as being a knife fight from the Stone Age. I can tell you like stories and history. Were you, were you looking to that as you headed toward college? Well, as I, as I said, I was terrible at math and I was terrible at science. And uh, history, English, English literature, I, I, I had a great time with. I really, really enjoyed. And, uh, and uh, so that's... But then you became a lawyer, which, you know, you don't have to know a lot well, about great English <laughs> literature. The best 
part about law school was I learned how to be specific in the use of language. I hadn't intended to be a lawyer uh, in private practice, and I graduated from law school in June of 1968, and within a week I'd gotten an induction notice, and I reported I was, I was off to Vietnam. And um, I'd, I'd broken my arm in an accident the year before, and the, the, the doctor in the induction center looked at it and said, I'm sorry, son, we can't take you. And I was completely stunned, completely stunned. I, I, you wanted to serve. There was no plan B. You know, my grandfather was an infantry captain. My father was an infantry captain. I was going, and all of a sudden I wasn't going. And, and, and then it was, what now, you know? What now? And I just graduated from law school, so obviously it was um, decide where to take a bar exam and, and at least have a license. So um, I went back home. Came back to Honolulu, got in a bar exam review course, and uh, took the bar exam. And uh, then things started to happen in a hurry. William Yama Chillingworth became a law clerk for the late federal judge Martin Pence. He credits Judge Pence for showing him how to command respect in a courtroom. I passed the bar exam. I got a call from Judge Pence's office. We want you here next week, Monday. <laughs> and uh, it was a dream job. It was, it was my... Uh, perfect job out of law school going to work for Judge Pence as a clerk and, um, and uh, bailiff because he was so good at what he did and he was so good at and so willing to teach the clerks who, who came to work for him. He was, he was in control. He told you where he stood. He, he, was, he was extremely good at controlling the courtroom and inspiring confidence in, in the people who were coming to hear him and come into um, the court, even as, you know, as I did as the, uh, the lowly clerk who was opening up the court sessions. Uh, he taught me so much about the courtroom process. How did was, he gain the respect of people who came before him? It was by demonstrating, demonstrating respect, demonstrating confidence, demonstrating respect, and you instill it, you inspire it in the, the people you're with. So that was your first job out of law school, and then what? Well, then I went to work for um, a law firm in Honolulu, um, a guy who's turned out to be a really good friend of mine, Alan Waddell. And I worked for Alan's firm in Honolulu for about a year, and uh, they had talked about opening an office on the, the Big Island. It didn't quite come together, and I had an opportunity to um, talk to Judge Pence about it, and he, he said, you know, my law partner in Hilo would be really happy to join forces if you're interested in going back to work in the, uh, in the Hilo courtroom setting. I did, I did. I went to work with Roy Nakamoto, who was Judge Pence's former law partner, and um, spent 12 years there, and was a trial lawyer, and got to go to court every day. So then one day I was um, in the office and got a call from the Judge Kubota in Hilo, and he says, come on in, I want to talk to you. I figured I'd done something wrong. Judge Kubota was kind of a curmudgeon that way, and uh, he called me in. He was with someone I didn't know, and they had uh, called me in because the Judge Mark Norman Oles had retired from the district court bench in Hilo, and they were looking for a replacement, and they wondered if I was interested. Of course I was. Um, after I was sworn in as a family and district court judge by Chief Justice Richardson, uh, the Chief Justice said, I gave you the job because you were the only one who got a unanimous vote from the commission. And, and so, so for 20 years, you rode circuit on the Big Island. I you, did. you went to all the courts and I did. heard cases which took you 
um, I mean, high level uh, legal arguments to, you know, probably assault and battery level, stuff. Low level, I heard everything that Divorces. came in the door. I, I put 300,000 miles on my cars and at the rate of 120 miles a day. It was uh, it was a bit arduous, and uh, but there were there were moments there were moments I, I saw I heard so many stories so many stories and all I had to do was be able to distinguish fact from fiction and sometimes it was easy and other times it wasn't and there were moments there were moments and those moments kept me. For a long time, they kept me going back. I had one, one day in, the, in a traffic court, I guess it was in Honokah, and a 16-year-old boy had been charged with a seatbelt offense, and I was hearing the sergeant who had issued the citation, and the sergeant was talking about how he had seen the event occur, and then I heard from the boy, and the boy told me he was wearing the seatbelt. And, and what do you do in that kind of a circumstance? And uh, so I asked about the configuration. Well, it was a convertible, and, and most cars have the seatbelt coming down from a post, which is above the shoulder of the operator. This one didn't. It came off the back of the seat and came around like that. And I thought, this officer probably had a difficult time seeing whether it was being used or not. I found, the, I found the, the young man not guilty. And about that moment, I see a hand going up in the gallery, and I'm going, uh-oh. And it turns out the, the boy's father is back in the gallery and is wanting to talk to me, and I'm going. He came up and he said, you know, after my son got the citation, he came home and said, Dad, I was wearing my seatbelt. And I looked at Dad and I said, I'm really glad I got it right. And he looked at me and he said, I'm really glad you got it right too because it taught my son a lesson about how justice is administered here. That you and can I trust said, the system. And I said, thank you, Dad. Those were the kind of moments that kept me going back. You, know. you probably saw people at their, you probably saw the worst common denominator in, in people's character as well. There were difficult days. There were, there were enormously difficult days, and, uh, and they, were, they were hard to leave behind at the end of the day. I found myself getting into canoe paddling. I found myself getting into yoga. I found myself getting into distance running, anything to get rid of the the accumulation of um, courtroom emotions, and most of the time they were negative, extremely negative. The grief, the, the desperation, the hurt, the, especially in the, in the family court setting. It was... Because uh, you're not in a position to do rehab with them. This is a no. yes or no, here's, here's the ruling and off you go. Right, and half the time, well, I wouldn't say half the time, but a lot of the time the, the ruling would be significant enough and emotional enough so that I'd reserve it. And, and you know, otherwise if I issued it, there'd be a fist fight going on in the courtroom on the way out the door. So I would, uh, I would withhold the, the ruling. I'd say, okay, I'm gonna look at this a little bit more and I'll have uh, my clerk call the attorneys and then as soon as we were finished I'd tell the clerk call the lawyers because you really this, you really that. did think violence would erupt I didn't want any more emotion than was already piled into that courtroom to, to, to come out of the decision so and of course in courts you know that a, a lot of times you know whatever you rule whether I mean one side's going to be angry and or distraught <laughs> what was that like to live with that was that was one of the difficulties of the job I knew that uh, no matter how I ruled somebody was going to come out of the courtroom unhappy with the ruling. Did that make it hard to go to shopping centers and parties? No, no. And, and, and for this reason, I made sure that if I couldn't do anything else, I let everybody know that I heard them. And I made sure that when they were finished presenting whatever they wanted to present, I looked them in the eye, I said, I hear you. What you're saying is thus and so. 
so that even if I couldn't always rule in their favor, they came out of the courtroom with the understanding that they had been heard. Did you get that from Judge Pence? I got that from Judge Pence. After William Yama Chillingworth saw the last of his three children off to college and retired from the bench on Hawaii Island, he tackled something his mother always wanted him to do, and that is to trace his native Hawaiian ancestry on her side of the family. This research led Chillingworth to an unexpected family connection and a new passion, capturing images of the Hawaiian hawk. We had two names and the Aupua were the old family home was located, the family home, it was the grass, the grass hollies. Um, I started with the, uh, the location of the Ahupua'a, the, the translation of the, the Ahupua'a name, and, and the fact that it was located between Hakalau and Ninole. Hakalau is a, is a well-known bird center. Um, the, the term, one of the translations is many perches, so that was, it was a bird center in old Hawaii. The, uh, the names were my great, 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 great grandfather and his brother. His name was Kani Ho'olani, and, and it was the, the, the most auspicious name. It was, it was the name that had me sitting down where I was living in Kohala and saying, great-great-great-great-grandfather, how in the world did you come by this auspicious name? Which means? It's the Hawaiian Zeus. It's the ruler of the heavens, the grandfather of Pele. I had a feeling that an answer was coming, and in fact it was. And, uh, and, and so I began, I'd always had a love of landscape photography, and I'd, I'd invested in some rather good equipment began taking it out and, and one morning I'm out in the eastern Kohala Valleys and, and this great bird comes over and screams at me. I mean literally screams at me and, I'm <laughs> and, and it's this enormous Hawaiian hawk and he's looking right at me and his wings are spread and he is the most incredible thing I had ever seen. And there was this immediate connection. Did you know what it meant? I, not at that moment. All I knew was um, I had made a connection and uh, I wasn't going to be doing any other photography than that bird up there. And I started coming back every day after that and waiting for the arrival of my royal friend. You know, there was no understanding the connection that was happening with the uh, the need to get myself out of bed in the morning, get the camera, and go to where the hawks were and begin collecting the images. It just went on and on and on. And then there was just that one final piece which had to do with my mother um, giving all of her children a copy of the book that um, Isabella Bird wrote. Oh, Bird. <laughs> Right. Somebody you never met, somebody from the England. Miss Bird, who was here in 1873 on the island of Hawaii. Oh, she loved Hilo. So she describes, Miss Bird describes how she went off to Waipio with my great-great-grandmother as her 18-year-old guide. My great-great-grandmother spoke Hawaiian, spoke English, rode, and, and had been on the Hamakua coast for her entire life and guided her up to Vipio and then came back and on the way back they went off the trail and went Malka a mile to where my uh, great great grandmother had a family ancestral home. They went up there because my uh, great great grandmother was receiving a, a wedding gift. She had just been married to Ben Macy from Nantucket and um, the wedding gift turned out to be uh, a feather lay, not just any feather lay. Lehulu Mamo Mele Mele, a yellow feather lay of mamo feathers. And then when I finally read that, everything came together. It, it, it was as if I finally understood that Miss Bird had met my ancestors, Kani Ho'olani and his brother Manuhoa. And from what she said, I was able to clearly identify that we were from a family of bird collectors and feather workers, and that 
Kanehualani is one of the most auspicious names you can give to a male Hawaiian son of a family of bird collectors, the ruler of the heavens. And his brother got the name Manohoa, the friend of the birds. Of course, it all fit together. A friend urged William Yama Chillingworth to have his collection of Hawaiian hawk photographs published. The result is a book titled Iulani, the Hawaiian Hawk. It won a 2015 Kapalapalapo'okela Award from the Hawaii Book Publishers Association. Post-retirement, Chillingworth, a divorcee, married again. His wife is a former Punahou schoolmate who is a New York Times best-selling author, Susanna Moore. Mahalo to William Yama Chillingworth of North Kohala on Hawaii Island for sharing your story with us. And thank you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha hui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. So next, feather making? <laughs> feather lay making? No more mamos, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, mamo are gone. Yeah. Uh, ole, unfortunately. And the, how are the Hawaiian hawks doing? The Hawaiian hawks are doing pretty well. They're, they're, they're estimated at 2,500 or thereabouts, and uh, I'm seeing more of them, which is very, very rewarding. I, I so enjoy seeing them.